uh, Randhadwa, and we are um, co-chairs of the inaugural CCS networking group. A key mandate of our group and the CCS um, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee is to foster diversity representation across sex, generation, geography, disciplinary, discipline and ethnicity as well. And while we were not able to secure a female panelist to join our diversity of male panelists live for the moderated portion of this e evening for various reasons, we are very grateful that Dr. Harris has provided some pre-recorded thoughts to share with us, with us tonight and that there is a diverse cardiovascular community in attendance for networking. We are also pleased to introduce our moderators for tonight, Nirman, who is a cardiovascular research associate with the Canadian Vigor Centre in Alberta, and Pai and Zach, who are senior cardiology fellows at Western University in Ontario. Thank you so much, Brenda and Jessica. So um, today we are very excited to have an all-star panel of cardiovascular medicine faculty. Our first panelist is uh, Dr. Andrew Cran. Dr. Cran is a professor of medicine, clinician scientist, and uh, department chief in the Division of Cardiology at the University of British Columbia. Uh, his research work is mostly focused on genetic arrhythmias and implantable uh, arrhythmia devices, mostly funded by the Heart and Stroke Foundation and uh, CHR. In addition to serving on several editorial boards, uh, including the roles of associate editor for Heart Rhythm, being a member of the boards of trustees uh, of the Heart Rhythm Society, he also joins us as uh, one of our uh, CCS past presidents. Our next panelist is Dr. Louise Harris. Dr. Harris uh, joined the faculty at the University of Toronto uh, back in 1987 as the first female electrophysiologist and was the first woman uh, promoted to the rank of full professor in the Division of Cardiology, where she remains active as an academic uh, clini clinician at the University Health Network Toronto General Hospital. Next, we have uh, Dr. Shahrukh Bakar. Dr. Bakar is an early career interventional cardiologist uh, representing the community of Salt and Marie in Ontario. Our next panelist is Dr. Andrew Fagan. Dr. Fagan is a cardi cardiac surgeon inter intensivist who recently completed a heart failure surgical fellowship at Northwestern University and will join the University of Manitoba as a new faculty member later this fall. Next, we have Dr. Sanjog uh, Kalra. Dr. Kalra is an early, career, early to mid-career interventional cardiologist at the Peter Monk uh, Cardiac Center, Toronto General Hospital, and assistant professor of medicine at the University of Toronto. He comes back home uh, after having practice at the Albert Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia and has been one of the past training committee chairs at, uh, at the Canadian Cardiovascular Society. With that introduction, um, we'll play a video summarizing the viewpoints of Dr. Harris uh, regarding contract negotiations and negotiations in general. Thank you. audio Milan thanks sorry about this I'll just uh, start it again Thank 
see that's what we we don't want that part um in you know what i mean hi so my name is louise harris and i am a cardiologist at uh, the uhn i came here as a resident back in 83 followed by a fellowship and uh, have been on staff uh, since 1987 so coming next year i will have worked in this environment for close to 40 years and i asked to have the opportunity to share with you some ideas uh, that i think may be helpful to you as you start to navigate this new landscape of uh, contracts uh, period these are my personal uh, thoughts and uh, i hope they will be of assistance uh, to you um, as one of the more senior or mature female cardiologists if, if only by age i have had the opportunity over the years to assist younger colleagues when they are not negotiating job descriptions. And also um, now more recently, I've been working with people looking to apply for promotion. My overall experience suggests that men and women approach contract negotiations quite differently. I do not have any formal experience in this uh, sphere, no training, and I don't have the answers to many of the questions that will be addressed uh, to the panel uh, but I do have some thoughts that I think might be helpful and some illustrative uh, anecdotes. When it comes to negotiating a contract or a one-on-one -on -one annual review with your chief, women often wait to be told the expectations, whereas men are far more likely to come prepared with a set of asks and sometimes even demands. And I'm going to illustrate that for you with an anecdote that indicates the difference in approach. When an email went out from the head of a division asking for nomination for a teaching award, a woman is more likely to think, I hope someone nominates me for this award. Whereas a man in this case actually contacted the division head and said, I would like to be nominated for the award and I believe I deserve it on the basis of the work I've done to date. So my first message is you need to be proactive on your own behalf. Going into a negotiation, Make a list of all the items that are most important to you in accepting the position. Go into your discussion prepared to be forthright about aspects of the contract that are most important and are the least negotiable, but be flexible on those items that you're willing to forego. It is a negotiation. It is not you being handed some prescription in, in advance. Secondly, you should have an expectation of being treated fairly. And to do that, you need to inquire of others at your level as to the conditions that they were offered and agreed to. You need to inform yourself. You need to do your homework. Find out how much teaching, how much lab time, how much on call, uh, what the structure for payment is. Often the person with whom you are negotiating may be unintentionally and or unconsciously biased. So if you know the ground rules for those in your cohort, you should expect some of that. Here's my second anecdote. Years ago, the cardiologist in charge for undergraduate teaching sessions and also find, needing to find clinician teachers willing to commit to weekly four-hour sessions for the academic year, I realized this person would routinely approach the women in the group uh, asking for their commitment and women wanting to demonstrate that they're team players and holding up their end of things would always acquiesce. So I realized we were doing this year after year. I counted the number of clinician teachers in the group and I divided that into the number of teachers needed each year. And when I was next approached, I was ready. I said I would do the teaching but on one in four years, which was an equal share, and that this physician should come back to me once a complete cycle had been uh, gone through and everybody had had their turn. And curiously, I was never approached again. Another comment, when you attend for your annual review, if you've worked hard and accomplished much, do not expect effusive accolades from your chief. It is your job 
to bring to your chief's attention what you have accomplished and what your requests are for the next year. So you need to give some thought. This is what I've done in the year that I want this person to know. But also, what would I like? What do I want to have in the year to come? Another anecdote. A newly appointed cardiologist at a major US center described her dismay at her first annual review. She had done a considerable amount of teaching, had several publications and grants and awards. So she went in anticipating praise from her boss, but little was forthcoming. And what you need to understand is that the chief may have 60 people to meet with, each needing a 30 to 45 minutes. And that's a time consuming exercise for them uh, with little for them to distinguish one from one individual from the other at first glance. And so it's up to you to summarize what you've done and to bring it to their attention, uh, to bring all your accomplishments to their attention uh, so that it's documented and can be used. They're not necessarily unwilling to consider it. It just not, may, may not be front of mind for them, given how many people they need to interact with. Remember, this is a business transaction and should be approached in a level-headed manner with the expectation of being treated fairly. Too often, women in particular feel grateful to have been offered the position, but at the same time, it is important to lobby on your own behalf. Value your talents and your skill set, and do not be afraid to identify that, while at the same time, not overstating your accomplishments. I've addressed most of these comments to the women in the group, but some of them apply to all of you. I hope you will have found this of uh, some help, and I wish you the best of luck uh, going forward in whatever you choose to do. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Harris again for taking the time to rec record uh, that video and for sharing those insightful thoughts. Um, our next question would be to Dr. Cran. Dr. Cran, uh, from a recruiter's point of view, uh, what are the main issues you consider in finding the ideal employee that you think prospective applicants might be able to use to put themselves in the best light? Well, that's a good question. So um, <clears throat> for context, uh, so I did much of my basic training in Winnipeg where there was a certain physician system and then I worked in London at Western for almost 20 years where there was a completely different physician system and now at UBC as division head and as a result I'm tasked with the idea of recruitment. So I have seen a bit of different ways in which things uh, work. Um, as a person who sort of oversees a division that, they, you know, the nucleus of the division is about 60 and then their low, greater division is about 150, um, you know, there's, there's a question about clinical skill sets, there's a question about academic skill sets, but the reality is most of the day-to-day -day life, what really drives it is basically personal fit. So, and, and this is no different than, quite frankly, you know, your home partnership if you have a partner. Um, or any kind of group that you belong to is that as soon as you get a group of, of more than four people, the potential for chemistry problems comes up. Um, and, and so uh, this is why resident programs tend to be fear, uh, tend to be a little bit homegrown is because of the old expression, the devil you know, as opposed to the devil you don't. So, you know, as much as a trainee might not be an ideal candidate, the reality is that they get along well, they'd be easy to make a call schedule with. And um, you can see that they're the kind of person who will pitch in in a crisis or something like that is probably more important than whether they're going to, you know, publish more papers or, you know, have an exceptionally low complication rate for a procedure or, uh, or those aspects of things. Um, I will say one thing that I think isn't talked about very much. I know it's something that's a bit more openly talked about at UBC, but I think there is a clear, absolute insistence on clinical excellence as a foundation for recruitment. 
And so um, I think if there is an instinctive concern that someone's not a good doctor, um, then you can get into real problems. Um, and, and unfortunately, what happens is people, it's, it's very Canada, it's sort of very um, unspoken. So people are, are gladly passive aggressive, and uh, they also don't come out and say what the problems are. And so that, and then that speaks to the whole, you know, the transparency of the process. I mean, one of the challenges the, the group that's listening must face is the, the system is so opaque. It's really a travesty. Um, I try to be more explicit. We have a very, we developed a very structured recruitment process for how this works. We've created some objectivity around the whole idea of, um, you know, posting a notification and application and interview processes. Um, but it's still, if you look at the outputs, it's still largely influenced by um, both qualifications, but really the interpersonal knowledge of the person. So you may be a terrific person and the peers around you very much reinforce who you are. Uh, but the reality is that uh, if there isn't an element of who you know in terms of connecting with the target applications, it takes some doing to win people over. So a very practical thing that's happened is, so we, in my 10 years here, we've recruited about to 23 people. And I can remember one out of tw those 23 experiences where meeting someone essentially cold led to a real turnaround in the process of probable priority because that person was an exceptional, um, you know, communicator and had a lot, and was also very sort of strong in terms of training and, and academic uh, skills as well. Uh, but most of the time, meeting new people who apply for a job, if they're unfamiliar to the group, it's an immense uphill battle to 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 uh, to uh, overcome. So I think the short answer is work hard at the people side of things. Uh, because many of your peers have sufficient academic uh, or clinical skills to compete um, because those unspoken things are, are dominant in at least the unconscious bias of people who go through the selection process. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I, I hope that's a, a helpful answer. Yes, thank you so much for that. Thanks, thanks for coming. I've got radio silence here. Are there other questions? Or Andy, are you moving on to the next person? We're happy to take any audience um, if there are any. Uh, otherwise, um, certainly we can continue the discussion at the networking portion if um, if you happen to be available with Dr. Crom as well. Yep. Um, I suppose I can ask the next question to our panelists. Uh, I see that, that Pei has now joined us. Maybe I guess I'll go ahead, Pei, you, you can follow up uh, next. Uh, this next question is actually for Dr. Fagan. Uh, so uh, Dr. Collar, I would just uh, reordered the, the list if that's okay. Um, but uh, Dr. Fagan, um, the question we had for you was uh, whether you can comment on, on some of your top tips for students uh, as they're um, navigating contract negotiations, if you may be able to share a couple of those uh, for the group's benefit. Um, from the perspective of someone who's uh, recently negotiated uh, their own contract. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I think it's helpful to sort of understand my perspective of where I came from, because it, it's it's obviously very different, I think, than someone five or 10 years in negotiating a contract or accepting a first job. But I recently finished a very long training process um, and then went through as part of that um, job hunting and then accepting a, a job um, and some of the comments that were mentioned earlier sort of resonate about feeling like it's sort of a you should just sign and accept things um, but I, I guess I'll touch on some of the things that were helpful to me going through that process as a new person who's never been exposed to something like that before I think my last job was a shoe shine boy at Nisbet's men's shop and where I grew up. Um, anyway, so three things that are that I thought were useful and reflecting back were just 
understanding the process of the particular institution that you're working with. And I'll, I'll touch on all of these in a little more detail in a minute. Um, the second thing I, I thought was useful was just run it by as many different people as you can. And, and finally, just don't be afraid to bring up what you think is important for your success. Um, so back to point number one, the, the process for me was um, I, I went through the interview process while I was interviewing at, at different centers. I received an offer from a place that was a at Winnipeg, which was a very good fit for me. They needed some a surgeon who also um, does critical care, and that's the job that I was looking for. Um, so the offer came, and it came with dozens of pages of contract stuff. Um, the contracts were all very sort of general. They talked about salary, what your overhead commitments were, um, how your time would generally be divided, clinical, academic, um, stuff like that, and just very general. Um, I knew that those contract documents were the same for everybody. So all the other surgeons in our group have similar background contracts. Um, and then I, I understood that the process would involve me sending sort of a response letter to their offer um, with more details of, of sort of deliverables and things I might need to obtain those deliverables. And then once that letter went back, then the Department of Surgery responded with, yes, we can do this, this is how we can make that work. And then after all of that, I signed the contract documents. So I had no idea that's how the process worked. I um, talked to people at the University of Manitoba within the Division of Cardiac Surgery. Um, and I, I talked to mentors and, and friends from residency who had gone through the process to kind of help figure that out. And I had a lot of guidance from um, the Cardiac Surgery Division in Winnipeg, which um, they're recommending the hire to the Department of Surgery, which then ultimately hires you with the university and the health authority. So they can, it's kind of a weird relationship where they're kind of your allies, but also um, they want something from you too, which sort of leads into the second point of figuring out all of this. It just kind of worked for me from word of mouth. So I had a lot of help from um, people in Winnipeg. The division head was very helpful in, in helping me navigate the process. I talked to um, previous recent hires there of how they went through. And then I talked to, to mentors and some friends who recently went through the process. And it, it was helpful from multiple aspects. Um, you need to be able to speak to the division so that you can help better flesh out your deliverables and how you may obtain them. Um, so you need to know what's there. If it's not the institution you trained at, the people there can really help you figure out what that might look like. If you did train there, you have some sense of, of the infrastructure that exists already. Um, it was also helpful to talk to mentors and, and friends to see what they went through. Um, the process with Winnipeg seemed very transparent to me, but it was, it was helpful to know that it kind of unfolds like that elsewhere as well too, and that what you're going through is a, a, a fair a, a sort of deal. Um, the last part of that, of just not worrying about trying to introduce what you need for success. So that was something I would have happily just signed the documents because you're excited for a job that seems like a great fit for you. Um, but I, I had lots of advice that sort of told me to put the brakes on and just think about what I, what you need to, what success would look like for you at that institution. Um, talk to the other members and see what you need. And you can sort of create, I called it a, a wish list, but it, essentially outlining what you're deliverables might be and, and what you need to obtain them. Um, and so you need lots of help to do that because especially if it's an institution you're unfamiliar with, um, you'll need help with the people there. And you I don't think at our stage, maybe other people have experience, different experience, but at, you're not negotiating salary or overhead costs with the university, but there is a lot you can sort of talk about just to make sure that it's going to exist. If you need to be part of a heart failure clinic, you want to make sure everybody's kind of thought about that and what it would look like before you take the job. If surgeons may need a particular instrument set, if you're doing minimally invasive, that doesn't exist, you should actually make sure they have those things in some intention of getting them. And, and nobody is going to try to um, pull a fast one on you. They just may not have thought something through thoroughly. So it's useful just to outline all those things you'll need. 
and, and your wish list and they'll come back and say these are how we can obtain these things or, or how we can achieve that or, or no this is not achievable we may need to go about it this way and I, I sort of felt like it was very much a partnership with with Winnipeg and and because they want you to succeed as well too and you want to succeed so I, I felt it very useful to work with the institution in my case um, so that's kind of how I navigated the process and I, I think that might look different for um, different stages of career and potentially for different institutions. Thank you for sharing those um, words of advice. Are there any questions from the audience? Questions in the, in the Q&A tab. I didn't see these earlier. Um, so I apologize if they were up already. There's one that directly relates to what you've discussed, Dr. Fagan. Uh, if, you, if you could just maybe briefly comment on it, recognizing that we have two other panelists remaining. Um, uh, an audience member asks, could you provide some examples of, of what kind of deliverables are asked for in a contract? Uh, um, could you be a bit more specific about that? Yeah, for sure. Um, so as someone who wants to work in critical care, but is getting hired as a surgeon, um, I wanted to make sure that they had thought about how I would fit into the ICU. So I specifically put in um, how many weeks I'd like to do in the ICU and specifically addressed issues around calls so that people had thought about um, how my call in the ICU may impact surgical call. Um, other things I, I looked at were more programmatic around um, shock teams and MCS and, and making um, there's interest in, in Manitoba and, and growing in those areas and just putting in some of the things that you might need to to grow in those spaces, different equipment, um, programmatic things, things like that. Um, I also uh, do a little bit of um, cardiac critical care, um, sort of global health stuff and that's something that I enjoy doing. And so I, I, I put that in there. I see a question about parental leave. This isn't parental leave, it's global health stuff. But I, I put that in there that I, um, can I get X amount of weeks um, that's not vacation time to do global health. So uh, things that were important to me that I, I think are reasonable things to ask, I, I included in there. And I also did this in partnership with, with the division members there so that I wasn't asking for anything crazy like a, a Ferrari or something. Okay. I guess um, this is a great segue into the uh, next uh, um, questions. You know, we talked about many elements of the contract uh, and, uh, you know, what you consider when finding for jobs as well as what employers are looking uh, at. So next question will be on talking about which areas of the contracts are most likely to be negotiable versus which ones aren't. Things like duties or call, compensation, benefits, leave policies, office space, and so on. And so um, for this question, um, we'll get some advice um, from both um, Dr. Kara uh, and Dr. Um, Bakar. Sure, who's going first? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Um, okay, well, uh, I'll uh, sort of, you know, first of all, thank you for having me uh, speak as a panelist. I did this a, a couple of years ago. It was a lot of fun. Um, my um, my kind of context is that I am uh, I basically graduated my IC fellowship in 2020 right as COVID started. Um, I ended up uh, leaving about three months early because I, um, uh, in talking with the St. Mike's group, uh, we were looking for someone to start in Sault Ste. Marie, uh, who has never had a full time internationalist spot here. So I mean, my starting over here was brand new um, because there was nobody else before me. Uh, in terms of doing intervention uh, as a full-time interventionist here. So when it comes to your question as to what is and is not negotiable, I think a lot of it is determined by uh, your practice location. So for me, it was very obvious that when I when I am here, I'm on call 24-7 for everything, basically. Yeah, basically everything cardiac-related, uh, which is a lot of work. But, um, but I 
and that was not really negotiable because if you sign up to do intervention and you sign up in a place where you're the only interventionist, it kind of follows that you're the one doing the intervention. Uh, you can't just uh, say that, oh, well, I want this day off and that day off. So, um, for example, on-call uh, is highly dependent on your practice location. So straight out of fellowship, being the only interventionist in a city, the expectation has to be that you're the one who's working, um, which is fine. I mean, if uh, if you're if, if you're a gung-ho and eager like I was um, and still I am uh, when I started off, then you know you really enjoy that and you love it. Um, you just have to be sure that uh, that this is something that you can do in the long term. Regarding other stuff, so I think it depends on uh, you know are you joining an established practice or are you doing something which is kind of uh, starting out afresh. So for me, um, my contract negotiation and uh, the negotiables were really, really, in some ways, very broad, but also in some ways, very specific. So, for example, being on call, it was very clear that, you know, you're going to be on call 24-7 for, for primary PCI. And uh, starting up a new program for primary PCI was sort of my mandate, uh, which went really well. And, uh, and uh, you know, I think it's, uh, it's really flourishing. Uh, so... Um, that part of it is not really negotiable, but there are, uh, but you know, there are things which are negotiable. So the other stuff in my contract was very broad. So uh, one of the mandates is that, well, in the days that I'm not in the cath lab, uh, then I'm basically doing ad hoc PCI for patients who need it, um, and I'm running clinic. So, uh, so running clinic basically you have free hold over how you run the place uh, because, uh, uh, like, basically getting referrals. Um, adjudicating referrals, triaging, um, booking patients in, and then the daily practice stuff, which happens all the time. Um, that is something, again, that you have a lot of flexibility over as to how you want to structure your day. So um, so I, I think it, a lot of this depends on where you're joining as to how many people are already there and what a certain place is looking for. Um, and I think the flexibility or lack thereof will come from uh, what the place you're joining is. So I think this is something which is quite important. It's some, certainly something that I didn't really consider when I was leaving fellowship as to uh, who was looking for what. But that's a key component when you're, when you're looking to join a certain place. Um, in my case, I already knew uh, what the city was looking for um, because I was uh, locuming here since 2016. So I kind of knew the landscape already. I knew how a practice would look, and it was a very straightforward decision as to how to um, structure practice. And it worked out exactly like that. Other people, uh, you know, so, you know, Dr. Grant talked about uh, cultures. Uh, I also did my uh, cardio training in London, so I kind of know what the London culture is like. But then having worked at other places, I know what different kind of places uh, feel like as well. So it really de depends on where you're joining and, uh, and, uh, who, and uh, who you're joining with. Um, yeah, there's... I'm trying to think of what to add to those very insightful comments. Um, I think the aspects of what are negotiable in a contract come down actually not to uh, the people you're working for, but to you. Because ultimately, what do you want out of your job? Right, is, is probably the first question you've got to ask yourself. If you want to be person amazing at job X, then you're going to want to push for what you need to achieve that, right? Most people, what they want out of their job is to be happy, right? And so to decide what is and is not negotiable really comes down to what you are willing or not willing to tolerate. If something is, is if an important component of your future life involves global health, like it does for Dr. Fagan, or like it does for me, um, whether the institution comes to me with a yes, that's negotiable or no, that's not negotiable. If I come to that with a listen, I travel somewhere else in the world once every month, either doing a live case or speaking at a meeting or going to proctor or whatever, that's very important to me. Then if the answer that comes back from there is this is not something that we can accommodate or that's not a negotiable possibility then the answer is we're not the right fit and good luck with your process you're not you're not for me and i'm not for you and so the answer to this question i thought about carefully because it's 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 largely dependent yes on where you go but you know what you all as trainees worked very hard to get to where you are right you you deserve to be valued 
And and in that, then you've got to decide what it is that you want out of your life. And the things that then are or not are not negotiable are not defined by necessarily just the place that you are, the environment that you're in, but what it is that you want out of your life. And that means that if things are not available to you in certain environments, then, you know, and, and they're considered non-negotiable, then that's probably not the right environment for you. I do complex PCI day in, day out. I put ECMO, Impella, Tandem Heart, Balloon Pump, whatever, sometimes Protect Duo is all in the same weekend. There is no way I'm going to be able to negotiate in the availability of that hardware in a rural center that doesn't have cardiac surgical backup or a high level CV or CICU. So trying to negotiate those things in is not really about me or about the individual that I'm negotiating with. It's about the nature of the system, right? So, so it does indeed come down to the environment that you're going to. And it also probably comes down to the, the stage you are in, in your career and what it is that makes you happy. I practiced in the United States. So I, I did a little bit of background on me. I did, um, I was one of the early people trained formally in complex and high-risk PCI, mechanical circulatory support and, and cardiac critical care as part of something called the CHIP program. And, uh, and then I joined a center in the US, which was the best thing in the world for me because it was a place where I got all the kinks out uh, and actually worked for the hospital. That was a very different negotiating environment than when I came to Canada, where I don't work for anybody. I work in a hospital, but I work for me. So while I was negotiating at the hospital in Philadelphia, which is where I used to work, I recognized at that stage that what I needed, what made me happy was a place where I could do lots and lots of volume and where I had the fundamentals around me to be able to do my job, right? So I had a CCU because of the critical care piece. I had CCU time. Uh, I needed a reasonable salary. I needed time in the cath lab. And so those are the things that I asked for. And to my surprise, when I asked for three days in the cath lab, they declined and said, no, no, you'll be in the cath lab at least four days, maybe four and a half, right? So, so the things that I asked for were the things that I needed to, to uh, achieve within those first five years, as you heard from Dr. Fagan. But um, the, the needs of the hospital were the things that were, quote, not really negotiable, right? So they needed me to churn out some volume and they needed me to be able to do my billing and they needed me to be able to see patients in clinic and recruit patients because that's how they made money in the US, okay? Um, versus when I came here, I mean, I work for me. I don't have a contract with anybody. I have a memorandum of understanding with the university. And so if I decide that I want to go to India for a weekend tomorrow to go and do a case, I can do that, right? And I needed that freedom. So so the, the negotiating process for me, the things that were important for me to include was that freedom, right? I recognized by this time, having spent five or six years in the U.S. system, that the cases that I do are anywhere from 90 minutes to 12 hours and 90 minutes long, right? So it's, it's, you know, it's sometimes all day, sometimes an hour. And so I needed a system in which my remuneration could be built around the deliverable that I was being asked for, as opposed to the typical kind of systematic remuneration. And what I learned actually was that um, that would not be possible because of the system in which we work, right? We work in a system where people are paid based on volume as opposed to based on quality, though that's changing slowly. And, and as a result, I recognized after investigating the system, so once again, going back to Dr. Bakar's point, where you're going, what was and was not negotiable. In general, my advice to you is ask yourself three things. Ask yourself where you're going, okay? So what kind of a center it is, and what they need of you, you know, what they're able to provide for you. Number two, what is it that you want to accomplish, right? What, what do you want to deliver? Do you want to build the, the country's best or the city's best program in X? 
do you want to just be really excellent clinically and love your job? Do you want to teach and run a, an academic program? Do you want to write, you know, worldwide red papers so that when you walk into a room, everybody stands, right? The, the ask yourself what you want and then consider for yourself non-negotiable the things that you're going to need to make yourself happy in that regard, to be able to achieve what you're trying to achieve. And if what you're trying to achieve does not marry with what your institution wants, you're not the right fit and it's time for you to go look elsewhere, right? And the, the third point is ask yourself what makes you happy, right? Because that's really probably the most important piece. And make sure that you ask for things that are necessary to make you happy. So for me, I needed the availability of my toys. Otherwise, I could not be happy. I love my job, right? So I would not have come back to any institution in Canada except the one that I'm at, because this is the one that, you know, I was able to say I never want to hear the word no, and I never have, right? Not every institution in the country would be willing to pull out a black card and say, yep, we'll get you whatever you want, whenever you need it. Just build us the program we need, right? And and the other thing that I needed was the freedom for me to be able to do the global health work that I do on a frequency that I choose to do it. I speak at meetings all over the world. I do cases all over the world. I love that. And I needed to make sure that I could do that. And I remember interviewing with my current CAF Hub director. And when I said that, I knew I was the right, we were the right fit because he said, you've misunderstood. We want you to do that. That's one of the reasons why we would want you here, right? So, so the, the, after that long drawn out, diatribe, the bottom line is what is includable in your negotiation, whatever you need to make you happy, because if they tell you that that's not not that's not negotiable, you need to find another spot. Uh, thanks to both of you for those uh, excellent words of advice. There's been um, several questions in the Q&A, uh, you know, regarding what you've um, talked about. So maybe we'll um, talk quickly talk about two of the questions uh, here. And so one for Dr. Bakar, um, do you recommend locuming prior to committing to your job? And uh, is there a expectation that locums are needed um, before they'll hire you uh, for, for the position? Uh, yeah, so speaking in, in my position, so I, uh, when I finished internal medicine and I was still in a cardiology trainee, I used to locum quite a bit. Um, so I used to come up north very often because A, I simply enjoyed it and you know, there's tricky, difficult cases all the time. Um, for my interventional uh, position, though, um, I actually was not asked to locum directly. And I think that's the, the reason was because um, I think people knew me enough through my fellowship program that I think they kind of were reasonably satisfied that I would uh, do a reasonable job. Um, but the other thing was in terms of a personality fit, I already sort of knew everybody here. So the people who interviewed me for my current position, I was already working with them clinically uh, through locum work. So it, it, it was happenstance that it just worked out because I locumed at the place that I eventually got hired. Um, I do know that a couple of my colleagues uh, did locum at different centers um, before they were hired. So I think that's not a bad idea. But the problem is that, you know, you, I think you kind of have to discuss that. It's kind of test driving. They, they're sort of test driving you and you're test driving them. Um, you know, fitting in with the culture, you know, different cath labs work sort of differently. Uh, there's an overarching theme and a camaraderie and, and, but different, you know, institutions do things a little bit differently. Um, but having said that, I think, uh, the personality fit has to be really important no matter where you end up. Um, as they say, you know, the three kind of, uh, major things you have to be available, affable and affordable. Well, in Canada, affordable is not really a huge deal, but uh, available and affable, very important. So for me, locuming was a very easy way of demonstrating that I already knew the place and I was a good fit. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, and thanks, Zach, for um, uh, reminding us of the time um, because there is a um, discussion, a networking part um, uh, of the session. I know there are many questions in the Q&A that we haven't had a chance to answer, but this will be a great time for everyone to, um, you know, um, get to a closer setting uh, and meet everyone at the table and um, to ask those questions.